So thank you for joining me, Mami, and thank you for joining me, Braima. It's a pleasure to have you. Five days into COP, what outcomes do we have? Are they favorable to Africa especially? So there have been some great initiatives launched here at the COP on Monday, 7th of November. The action plan of the Early Warning for All initiative was launched. Also, the International Alliance for Drought was launched. And while these are global initiatives, these will benefit the African continent immensely. And we all know that this is the continent which has contributed the least to this climate crisis, but is bearing the heaviest brunt. So I believe that there has been a lot of good things happening here at the COP for implementation. Well, as, as far as Africa is concerned, I think the number one thing to say, uh, we came here with expectation, and I believe the conversations taking place is going right to the expectation of Africa. Uh, Mami has mentioned about loss and damage. Uh, for the reason that she talked about, it's extremely critical to Africa to make sure we can save life and livelihood. I think second, when it comes to early warning system, the biggest concern of Africa, to have access to technology, to data, so we can model the risk and take the necessary policy or funding actually actions. And this is something hopefully we walk away from Sham El Sheikh and making sure that accessibility becomes a reality. And last two concerns of Africa, it's about the commitment on adaptation. I hear a lot of commitment made here and there from different sources and talks about funding. Hopefully by the time we leave, when we do the tally and how much money that we get from commitment, then we can get to actually implementation. I think last but not least, energy transition remains a concern as far as Africa is concerned. And we're having a conversation around that. So hopefully we can walk away on those two, four elements that are important to Africa with something much more hopeful and optimistic going forward. Ibrahima, I would like you to establish a new relationship between early warning systems and risk insurance, which our group is about. If you look at, for example, disasters in, in Africa, the way it's been addressed for quite some time to the humanitarian intervention, uh, nothing against humanitarian intervention, but the situation we used to face with, sometimes the help may come too late. You may lose life and livelihood. So what ARC is saying, linking up to early warning system, and said, if you can actually model it and anticipate, it'll help decision makers to make the right decision. So for us, we look at it at three levels. It's number one, help countries to profile the risk. You can't address a problem, you don't know the magnitude of the problem. So by profiling the risk, the government has two options, to retain the risk within the national budget so they can have money for contingency planning and take actions. Now the other part, that's where the insurance comes in, then you can pull the risk of different countries, take it to the insurance market, pay a premium, and when that disaster actually triggered, then you can get a payout, and your first response to save life livelihood comes from the insurance market. And this is extremely critical in countries in Africa with the physical challenge. They may not always have money in their budget to do so, but as far as the people are concerned, they don't really care too much whether you have the money or not. And it's our responsibility collectively to come up with something innovative uh, to support them. But beyond just the insurance, the innovation comes from the fact that when that money is likely due to the country, it's available for the next two weeks after the disaster. And the intervention is rapid and fast track in a way that you can get it to where it's needed. And I think that's where the innovation comes in. It doesn't necessarily mean that humanitarian intervention is not important. It's still important. But we're increasing the capabilities of government to respond to disaster when they happen. I'll come back to you to talk about how it works for the ordinary citizens of uh, countries affected by these disasters. But before that, Mami, you were together in Glasgow. Between Glasgow and now, what has changed as far as climate change and DRR is concerned? So let me start from the bad news. I think that the bad news is that even within this one year, we have seen so many disasters with the intensity increasing, the duration increasing, and it has been nonstop. I'm not gonna even name them because it, and it happened everywhere. Of course, in Africa, flood in Nigeria, um, drought, Horn of Africa, but also in Europe this summer, another summer of disaster. So that's the bad news. The good news is people are now well aware 
that we cannot afford to just wait for the disasters to attack us and kill people, to lose economy, etc., etc. So the awareness is there, the determination is there, and now, as Ibrahima just mentioned in your answer to the previous question, we need to see the commitments delivered, the commitments of financing, the commitment of doubling adaptation financing to $40 billion, which was committed a year ago. And this is what we need to see. And if we can't do this, we know that we are damned, honestly. This is happening in Africa. It's been dubbed as the African Cup. And so therefore, the concerns of Africa are put on the table when Cup is happening in Africa. And I think that's a big uh, change from, from Glasgow, obviously. I think second, I sense uh, a little bit a sense of uh, urgency. In all the conversations I've been part of, people are thinking about, well, we can't go to another Cup without owning our commitment. I was the other day at this event with the Arab donor group where they announced about $24 billion going to adaptation. And I'm sure the European and others are also making similar announcements. So let's look at what the numbers say. Even if we don't get the $100 billion, at least we start somewhere because any money will be actually helpful in getting us going. What also has changed, I've seen the African government in particular getting themselves better organized, better prepared. So when the funding is actually available, it goes to actually areas where it's needed. And I think last but not least, the human face of climate change is being put on the table. So going back to your earlier questions, eventually, if we can't demonstrate that our action will lead to saving life and livelihood, we're not basically you know, making our case. In the case of my organization, the ultimate goal when we get the insurance money is to be able to act as the first response to protect the lives of the communities that are affected by climate change. And these are people who will, will live below poverty line, these are people like who live off uh, agriculture. Any rent deficit affects their ability to actually survive, and that's really the bottom line. Round it off with your expectations as outcomes from COP at the end of these old meetings and promises and discussions. When all is done, what do you see coming out of COP? And I'll be grateful if you can situate this expectation for the most impacted region of the world, which is Africa. From my perspective, I want to see disaster risk reduction, the agenda of prevention, <coughs> coming strongly out from the, this COP. And of course, uh, we know that disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, there is a lot in common. Until now, we have seen that the agencies that carry the disaster risk reduction agenda, the disaster risk management agencies, and the agencies, authorities that carry the climate action adaptation agenda, the environmental ministries or agencies, they really didn't work in sync. But now we have a clear understanding, and I think this is important for Africa, that we can't only look at climate risk. We need to integrate climate risk with all other disaster risks of including vulnerability and exposure. And this is about looking at poverty, this is about looking at gender inequality, and only when we put these thing things together, we can build resilience. I think that this is something that could come out very strongly from this COP when we are talking about loss and damage, and this is strongly my hope, and I am certain that this is will benefit the most vulnerable of all countries, which uh, many of them are in the African continent. First of all, life doesn't stop after COP27. So we need to sustain this momentum of solidarity working together in a way that after COP we can then get into actions. And I think that will be my hope. And then second, accountability. When people make this co uh, commitment here at COP, we don't want to go back to our daily life and realize that we made some commitment here. So hopefully, uh, the secretary you know, organizing uh, the COP will pay attention to that and making sure that it can't be lead to moving from words to actions so we can begin to see the resources. I think the last two points equally important. There are many existing organizations in Africa, in Latin America, we need to empower the local organization so they can be part of the solutions. 
Because you can get all the money of the world if we don't have the right organization to implement them, nothing's going to happen. And I think last but not least, let's bring the human face. It's all about the people we're trying to protect. And if we can't act a demonstrate we're doing so, certainly we're not doing our job. And I always say to people, we can multitask. You can do resilience, adaptation, and mitigation at the same time. It's not one thing and the other. And we should learn to multitask so that we can deliver on the people across the world. Thank you very much, Bariba. Thank you, Mami, again for joining us. We hope to see you in Dubai <laughs> for COP28 with better results, expectedly. Thank you very much for your time.